Yes, uh, I, yeah, yeah. It, okay, perfect. So applied. once again, it's a pleasure uh, to have uh, you here uh, today, Genoveva, and the screen is yours. Okay, I'm, I'm just getting a lot of messages because I, I guess that I'm co-host, oh. but someone else, someone else will admit these people, right? I, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, because there's, the screen is full of messages. Okay, well, anyway, um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is, I'm really, really happy to be here. I would be happier if I was in Warsaw, which is oh, an absolutely wonderful city. I enjoyed my time there very much, but I mean, it's still nice to do it, to do this thing online. All right, so I'm going to be talking about um, issues that have to do with theoretical concerns, but also exper um, also concerns about experimental um, experimental philosophy approaches to the semantics of natural kind terms. First of all, before I keep going, I need to make a disclaimer because actually, for me, uh, the term semantics of natural kind terms is a misnomer. I mean, from my point of view, general terms, kind terms, they all have the same semantics. They either, uh, you can say, they either they designate kinds or they attribute membership uh, to kinds of things. So from my point of view, tiger, gold, um, pencil, and philosopher, they all have the same semantic behavior. And in fact, they have defended this um, repeatedly in papers with my, my colleague, uh, Jose Martinez Fernandez, which we have published already four papers on this issue. And we treat all these terms with, a, with the same semantically uniformly. Now, from my point of view, there are interesting metaphysical issues as regards natural kinds. What are natural kinds? Are there any such things? So what makes things or samples members of a kind? Those are very interesting issues, but those are mostly metaphysical issues. Um, they're not semantic. However, it's also true that derivatively, the metaphysics we presuppose has an impact on the way we use terms and hence on their semantics. But in any case, I just want to make clear that I myself do not distinguish semantically natural kind terms from other kind terms. Uh, and in what, but in what follows, I will be focusing on a discussion that raises issues about some natural kinds, in particular biological kinds, and also about the use of those terms. So I will often fall in line with the way people in this kind of debate talk, and they 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 usually talk using the term semantics of biological kinds, a term biological kind terms or semantics of natural kind terms. Okay, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, the approach to natural kinds and to the semantics of kind terms in particular natural kind terms, defended by Kripke and Pannam, which from now on I will call it the KP approach, has been discussed, objected to, and defended since it was proposed in the early 70s. Oops, sorry. Um, now, Kripke and Pannam endorse an externalist also known as causal historical approach to semantics, according to which facts that are beyond the cognitive grasp of a competent speaker can contribute to the determination of the reference of the speaker's use of a term. Now, Kripke's arguments, and in particular Pandam's Twin Earth story, are meant to dislodge the classical descriptivist paradigm that was generally accepted at the time especially as regards terms such as gold, water, or tiger. Now, it should be noted that Pandam, at least, and at least for some, at some point in time, 
Um, the considerations against descriptivism applied also to terms such as pencil. But as I say, let's put all this aside. Now, um, the debate around the Kripke Pandem approach has taken different forms. Some authors have argued for or against the model, putting forward arguments that focus on the scientific practices of naming and classifying in different disciplines or on the theoretical commitments of specific scientific theories. For instance, one of the very early dissenters, John Dupre, um, in a paper that he published in 1981, examining how classification is conducted in the biological sciences, argued that the kripke pandem model was inadequate. And others have brought to the fore arguments that rely on scientific practice in chemistry, physics, and other disciplines. And here I have a few of the, of the papers that, as I say, John Dupre was an early dissenter, that's from 1981, but recently there has been uh, a debate also and against the kripke pandem model, you have papers by Soren Hockwist and also Wickfirst defending the kripke pandem account. You have a, a paper that I wrote with Carl Hafer, well, two papers that I wrote with Carl Hafer, also Panu Raiti Kanen, a paper that he wrote in 1921. Um, now, the debate has, con has been conducted also in another way. It has been conducted also on the basis of experiments that seek to collect data by asking participants in the experiments to respond to questions after being exposed to stories, similar to the ones envisaged by Pandem in the Twin Earth scenario. Now, the discussion based on this methodology is not just a recent phenomenon circumscribed to philosophers. On the contrary, although some studies in categorization led entirely by psychologists, obtained results that suited some aspects of the kripke pandem approach. So for instance, Blance's Rips paper, other studies, for instance, Brace V, Franks and Hamptons, obtained results that were not in line with what were taken to be the crucial assumptions of the model. Uh, Now, the discussion of the KP model um, has taken another turn recently with the publication of some studies by experimental philosophers. Some of them have been conducted in collaboration with psychologists, and those studies have focused on biological kind terms. Now, following the strategy that was exemplified by the psychologists, namely Braceby and colleagues, and other psychologists, experimental philosophers test the general population by presenting them with stories involving natural kinds and deriving from their responses some conclusions about the use people make of the terms that designate those kinds. This is in line with the methodology applied by experimental philosophers to test whether the counterfactual scenarios that philosophers envisage to reach what they take to be intuitive conclusions for instance, about the correct application of a term, provoke the same kind of reaction among the population at large. Now, here we'll discuss critically some of the conclusions presented in recent studies performed by experimental semanticists. But before focusing on the discussion and in order to put some issues in context, I want to present some general reflections about experimental philosophy in general. Okay, a few remarks about experimental philosophy and what is called the armchair. The vast majority of experimental philosophy studies consist in telling people a story or having them read a vignette and then asking them certain questions. Experimental philosophers often describe their objectives as testing, testing the intuitions of a population to determine whether their intuition and those of professional philosophers coincide. Now, this has led to interesting discussions on of what intuitions are and of or what kinds of intuitions are relevant. Now, I will not engage in that discussion 
um, Tim Williamson, Michael Devitt have engaged in that kind of discussion. Because it seems to me that the kinds of tests in which people are given a vignette and then answer some questions, that's what I would characterize as, sorry, every time someone wants to come in, I cannot keep going forward. Okay, now, uh, test what, um, what I would characterize as initial reactions or initial responses to the story told. In those tests, participants are presented with a story and then they're expected to provide the answers that seem natural to them. So I believe it is right to think of the data collected as initial responses. And I'm using here initial because the declared objective of experimental philosophers is in fact not to collect heavily reflected on data. So this raises an issue. What should philosophers do with those initial reactions? Now, this is a question that deserves some thought because we often find experimental philosophers claiming that the results of their tests should have consequences for philosophical theories. Just to give a couple of examples, Mashuri, Mallon, Nicholson, Stitch in their seminal 2006 article claimed that their results raise questions about the nature of the philosophical enterprise of developing a theory of reference. And Kova et Alter, many other authors in the paper, after performing tests on aesthetic judgments, conclude that the, they say, that's a quote, the traditional way of approaching the debate over the nature of aesthetic judgment is fundamentally misguided. And they also conclude that philosophical inquiries about the nature of aesthetic judgments should no longer take certain assumptions as a starting point. So that's taking the results of the experiments and applying them directly to whether philosophical theories are correct or incorrect. Now, back to the question, what should we do with those initial reactions? See, I often teach philosophy of language and I explain to students that an essential part of semantics is the theory of truth conditions. And since it's important to get clear uh, what we, about what we mean by truth conditions, I ask this question to my students. If we called birds pigs, would pigs fly? Now, when I ask this question, about 80% of the students raise their hand. Yes, if we call birds pigs, pigs would fly. And the majority of the remaining 20%, I suspect, don't react because they think that this must be a tricky question and the obvious answer may not be right. So what do I do with this? What do I do with their initial reaction? Well, I discuss it and I reflect with them. I do not conclude that evidence collected year after year of teaching introductory philosophy of language supports the claim that lay people think that all you need to do to make a pig fly is just a matter of changing how we call them. I proceed to explain now, when we ask ourselves whether what we say when we use a given sentence would be true under different circumstances, namely whether I, what I say when I utter pigs fly would be true in the circumstances described, that we're not asking whether the sentence if uttered under different circumstances would be true or express a truth. We're asking whether what we in fact say would be true in a, in a scenario that differs from actual circumstances, only in the fact that birds are called pigs. Now, it doesn't take too long for my students to see that they interpreted the question as the question whether the sentence pigs fly would express the truth if uttered in a scenario in which we called birds pigs. And that this interpretation is not what we are after 
when we ask ourselves about the truth conditions of our utterances of pigs fly. Now, when they understand that, they understand what it means to say that if two utterances of sentences have different truth conditions, they must be expressing different things. And they can thus master tools that we need to advance in our philosophy of language course. And of course, they also learn that the only way pigs could fly would be for them to grow wings. Something that I do not doubt it for a minute. They knew it all along. All this suggests, in my view, that it's not even clear at all that people's initial reactions are evidence of what they really think. As philosophers, we need to ask ourselves what we can use as the raw material to start the philosophical enterprise. And immediate knee-jerk reactions uh, is not clear that they are the ticket. Do we need knee-jerk reactions or do we need subsequent reflective responses? In any case, I don't deny that knowing the initial reactions of my students is extremely helpful. Among other things, it allows me of confusions that need to be resolved. But the data does not have and should not have an impact on the theory of truth conditions. Philosophical and philosophically guided reflection on the data is necessary in general, rather than att attempting to base or debunk philosophical theories by appeal to the kind of data collected in experimental philosophy surveys of initial reactions. That may be more fruit, it may be more fruitful to think about the data in question as the starting point to deliberate on the source of considerations than that once highlighted lead to reflective and reasoned responses on the part of the participants in experimental tests and a forte aura on the part of the general population. Now, that's not to say, that's not just an abstract philosophical point. I believe that experimental philosophers have the responsibility to clarify their stance on this issue, especially in an era of instant, non-reflected, evidence-blind opinions and reactions. Of course, this is not to say that knowing the immediate and reflective responses, as I already argued, of people has no value to philosophical reflection. And I'll say a few things more later. Now, um, there have been, sorry. Now, it is tempting to conclude that although experimental philosophy may provide interesting data for philosophical reflection, so-called armchair philosophy continues to have a decisive role. I myself would be happy with that conclusion if it weren't because I'm not sure what the term armchair philosophy is supposed to apply to. The papers that I mentioned before, Dupre, the discussions with Wickfors and Hawkwest and so on, um, pieces that engage in a debate on metaphysical and semantic issues involving kinds and kind terms present arguments based on scientific theories and consider examples taken from past and recent history of science. Pondham himself has physical and chemical facts and theories very present in his arguments. In, and in 1990, justifying the simplification regarding water as essentially constituted of molecules of H2O, he writes the following. I shall stick to high school chemistry because the actual quantum mechanical picture of the structure of water is immensely complicated. And, and he knew, he knew what the quantum mechanical formula was. Now, I'm not sure if experimental philosophers regard these works as products of armchair theorizing. I myself regard them as products of reflection on scientific practice. But if experimental philosophers regard that as, as armchair philosophizing, they should say why it is so. In any case, I think that the armchair philosophy metaphor definitely needs sharpening. All right. Um, so now 
experimental and theoretical issues about biological kind terms. There have been as of late um, several experimental studies on the use of kind terms, often with widely different results. Some of those studies report substantial disagreement among participants and even a good number of contradictory responses by individual participants. In this paper, I will discuss the conclusions of some of these studies, and I, try, I will reflect on their impact on the theory of reference of, for kind terms. Now, the literature on this topic is very extensive, so I will focus on some of the most recent reported results on the use of biological kind terms. These are the papers there. You know, uh, it's um, the papers that I have here. How Kyoja, Nyquist, and Jilka, uh, as well as David and Porter. In these papers, they use a mixture of elicited production, where people are asked to use the terms being studied, it's a more qualitative sort of uh, test where people are asked to do things and then it has to be valued how exactly they are using the terms from their answers. And they also use truth value judgments, TVJs, where um, participants are asked to answer true or false when prompted with some sentence. They're prompted with this after reading a vignette, they're prompted with a sentence, they are, they are supposed to say true or false. Now, although David and Porter, you'll ultimately criticize some aspects of some aspects of the methodology, followed by how Kyoja, Nyquist, and Yilka, um, both studies agree in concluding that both mainstream externalist and traditional internalist theories of reference are mistaken. That's how Kyoja and, and colleagues. Um, and so that we should abandon the common assumption that any one theory of reference fits all natural kind terms, that's David and Porter, because there are indeed both descriptive and causal historical elements to the reference determination of biological kind terms, that's David and Porter again. Now, a more recent article by David and Porter draws similar conclusions from further tests. Now, in a prior study involving proper names, Michael David and Nicholas Perot had used elicited production and truth value judgments. Now, the, the, the use of elicited production was particularly important back then um, because their study came in the heels of prior surveys that obtained results in line with the predictions of a descriptivist approach to the semantics of uh, singular terms and kind terms, but that relied heavily on questions eliciting referential ju judgments, now, questions that constituted evidence of the participants' opinions as regards what users of names referred to, not evidence of how they themselves use the term. Uh, now, performing tests that did target the participants' usage, like using elicited production and truth value judgment, um, <clears throat> David and, Por and Porot obtained results substantially consistent with the causal historical non-descriptivist picture. Now, in extending, in extending the David Porot methodology from singular to kind terms, David and Porter tell us that they, their hope was that the correct methodology would confirm the results that David and, um, and Porot had obtained using similar methods for proper names, results that gave overwhelming support to the causal historical picture. But the results of the tests with biological kind terms came as a surprise. So they tell us the results were neither what we expected nor what we had hoped for. Far from showing that the kripke putnam causal historical theory is correct after all, they confirm the main conclusions of earlier tests. Reference is to be explained partly descriptively and partly causal historically, namely non-descriptively. So, um, In the 2021 paper, David and Porter perform an um, elicit production test in which after presenting participants with a vignette, they put forward 
two statements to the same participants, one of which corresponds to the descriptive stake of the story, another one that corresponds to a non-descriptive non stake. And they also perform two truth value judgment tests in which each group of participants is given one statement. One group is given a descriptive statement, the other one is given an anti-descriptive statement. Now, on the basis of the results, David and Porter examined different proposals as to how the reference of biological kind terms is to be accounted for. Given that the results were, were not, they were not expected, but it's like an ambiguity theory or a hybrid theory. They ultimately defend the hybrid theory, but I will not discuss, discuss these proposals to focus exclusively on the tests and the results. So consider some of the results of some of the tests performed by David and Porter. First, faced, that's directly from the paper, faced, from, number one, faced with both non-descriptivist and descriptivist options at once, participants' choices were close to 50-50 with only an insignificant preference for the non-descriptivist one. Two, now those are the truth value judgments. Faced with a non-descriptivist statement without having been presented the descriptivist statement, an extremely significant proportion of participants chose the non-descriptivist answer. They gave up very high marks to the non-descriptivist answer. Yet, Faced with, with a descriptive statement without having been presented with a non-descriptive statement, a highly significant proportion of participants chose the descriptive one. Now, these results, they claim, support strongly the presence of descriptivist and non-descriptive reference determination of biological kind terms, both within the community, but also within individuals, because the results that they got had individuals, single individuals, going in one direction or another at different times. Now, first, before going ahead, there are a few confusions about the theoretical, not, not the experimental, the theoretical assumptions underlying the discussion of natural kind terms, as I say, they're independent of the experimental issues raised by, uh, by in these papers. And I think that they're worth mentioning and they should be avoided. Now, the disagreement between the descriptivist or internalist and causal historical anti-descriptivist or externalist approaches to semantics is presented by David and Porter as follows. They say, according to the causal, to causal historical theories, a biological term like tiger does not refer to an animal in virtue of its having the superficial properties picked out by speakers as by speakers associated descriptions, but rather in virtue of its having the same deep structural properties, the same as they say, underlying essence. Now, it is common to associate the causal historical picture to the postulation of deep natures or essences. David and Porter also endorse the association, and so do Haukyoja and colleagues. The latter, Haukyoja and colleagues, often mention in their discussion Quote, evidence of ambiguity between superficial and deep features in categorization. And they use that as a sign of the internalist and externalist pool in different directions. But I think that it's important. This is based on a confusion on two counts. Um, first, the description associated with a term may well be a description of the deep nature of a kind or a substance. Um, Nigel Saberton Leary in 2010 mentions the case of the term tungsten. The meaning of tungsten is given by the description that captures the essence of tungsten, the element with atomic number 74. 
any application of the term tungsten to a sample that does not satisfy the description is just incorrect and incompetent. So obviously, a descriptivist approach to reference is not contrary to the postulation of deep natures, and it does not automatically deny them any role in the determination of reference. Second, the second count on which the assumption is wrong. We should not forget that a crucial component of Putnam's approach is the idea that we classify by similarities. And the similarities in question may well not be deep structure. Although it's true, the appeal to deep structure is a way to argue for the externalist stance that meaning is not in the head, or at least not all of it. So this is something that, so you also have non-essentialist similarities. Um, this is something that my, with my co-author, Lorena Ramirez Ludeña, we pointed out in 2016. We said, it is often taken for granted that the Kripke Putnam approach to semantics of general terms is committed to essentialism, the postulation of shared underlying natures that are not immediately accessible or observable and can be discovered only by scientific investigation. But commitment to essentialism is not constitutive of the approach. On the kripke pandem model, some samples or, or individuals are treated as paradigms. And other instances are classified as members of the same kind by virtue of their similarity to the paradigm. The similarity could be superficial based on how new yet to be classified objects or samples appear or look or based on sameness of function. The kripke Panda model does not impose that the relevant criterion is essence. The novelty of the view is rather that it opens the door to the possibility that the similarity that is responsible for certain classification into kinds be entirely external to the minds of speakers. And of course, the appeal to, micro, to the micro, microstructure of water, the appeal to underlying essences, essences in the twin earth case, makes the point dramatically, since hardly anything could be more out of cognitive access than a yet unknown microstructure. In any case, the dissociation of the external stance from the postulation of the role of shared underlying natures it's just, this is not just a charitable reinterpretation of, of, of what Pandam said. Pandam himself was very clear on this. Look at what he says in 1975. Another misunderstanding that should be avoided is the following. To take the account we have developed as implying that the members of the extension of a natural kind word necessarily have a common hidden structure. It could have turned out that the bits of liquid had no important common physical characteristics except the superficial ones. In that case, the necessary and sufficient condition for being water would have been possession of sufficiently many of the superficial characteristics. Um, Now, in any case, Devitt and Porter in their 21, 2021 paper and how Kyoji and colleagues in their 2021 paper claim that people are pulled in different directions. The causal historical direction when they classify samples according to their deep nature and the descriptivist direction when they classify according to superficial features. I, as I said, I think that that's a mistake, but in order to continue the argument, um, that's what they are assuming. Uh, now, there are some hypotheses about why this happened, why there is, people are pulled in different directions. Um, uh, Tobia, Newman, and Novi suggest that the variation is driven by context. In a case in which people had to judge whether something was a salmon, um, 
they, the participants tended to rely on superficial features in legal scenarios, something that appears to suggest that in practical contexts, users of kind terms are consistent with the predictions of descriptivism. So it's an issue about what kind of context, the idea being that in a more practical context, people tend to go descriptivist. In a more scientific context, people tend to go uh, causal historical. But actually, David and, sorry, um, David and Porter find no evidence of that contextual sensitivity. Um, according to the results, the variations are not driven by context, but rather by whether a term is or is not the term itself or of practical interest. Now, in their tests, David and Porter, um, this is the manuscript. This is the, the, the new uh, paper. In their tests, David and Porter compare a term with no practical interest, Rio de Janeiro Myrtle, with a common term with obvious practical interest, rice. And they report that whether in scientific or practical scenarios, it just doesn't matter. The results support a causal historical theory of Rio de Janeiro Myrtle and are evidence against a causal historical theory of rice. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just say, this is just one aside. I, I don't know how solid the results are that the variation is not driven by context because there are, um, there are many cases in which the context makes a whole difference. And there is the famous um, case that is also a legal case uh, about fruit. There is a culinary uh, use of fruit according to which um, tomatoes are not fruit. And then there is a botanic use of fruit according, with, according to which tomatoes are fruit. And that falls pretty much in line with the context, whether people are talking about culinary matters or they are talking, or, or whether you have botanists talking about scientific matters. I don't know. This is one of these things that I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the how um, solid the result is. But in any case, um, the idea is that in the case of Rio de Janeiro Myrtle, which is a which is a which is a term with no practical interest, people go causal historical. In the case of rice, people go descriptivist, whether they are in a scientific context or in a regular um, run of the mill common common sense uh, everyday life context. Okay, now. I'm not going to discuss the details and the relative merits of these studies now, but there's one thing about the Rice case that I think um, is, is important to reflect on. Um, now, one of, the, one of David and Porter's vignettes tells the story of a synthetically created seed that has the same look, taste, and nutritional content. Well, nutritional content is not an observable feature, but let's pass on that. But it has the same look, taste, and nutritional content as oriza sativa, which is what we usually call rice. But this new seed, synthetically created seed, has a completely different genetic structure. Now, the idea in the vignette is that a lab assistant takes a bag of the new seed to a restaurant where he's friends with the chef. And the chef serves the new seeds as rice. And the question is whether what the chef serves is rice. Now, although the responses are 
significantly more in accord with the causal historical approach. There's a very substantial minority of descriptivist answers. Supporting the general conclusion, according to David and Porter, that there are both causal, historical, and descriptivist elements in the determination of the reference of rice. So there are many people who answer, yeah, that's rice. That what the chef serves is rice. Now, David and Porter, in their 2021 paper, are surprised at the proportion of users that seem to be guided by a definite description. Um, associated with the terms tested. Now, several questions. How surprising should the results be? Now, I don't think it should be surprising to us that people are ready to put together things according to the features that are important to them. In particular, if the term in question is what David and Porter qualify as a term of practical interest. And often, superficial features are important. They are the features that we use every day to identify things. And as we will see later, even Pandan agrees with that. Um, not even Pandan, as I say, was surprised. Um, this was in 1975 when he wrote this. Um, he said, in one context, water may mean chemically pure water, while in another, it may mean the stuff in Lake Michigan. And structure may sometimes be unimportant. Thus, one may sometimes refer to X, Y, Z as water if one is using it as water. And later on, he says, we discover tigers on Mars. Well, tigers on Mars. That is, they look just like tigers, but they have a silicon-based chemistry rather than a carbon-based chemistry. Are Martian tigers tigers? It depends on the context. Mm -hmm. So even for Pandem, it's not surprising that people sometimes decide to classify things according to very superficial features. Um, The observation of the variation in usage that David observes um, leads them to the conclusion that um, actually, how Kyoja and colleagues also agree with that, both mainstream externalist and traditional internalist theories of reference are mistaken. That's because there's this variation in usage. And now it's David and Porter. We should abandon the common assumption that any one theory of reference fits all natural kind terms. Um, the presumption here appears to be that the externalist causal historical position denies that there can be uses of kind terms governed by cognitively accessible definite descriptions. Right? Why else? Would the presence of responses consistent with descriptivism suggest that externalism is mistaken? Now, this is something that I have been arguing, that I have argued in the past. Remember that I was talking first about a, a, a theoretical issue and confusion that was number one. Now, this is a theoretical confusion number two. I've argued in the past that this is to misunderstand the dialectic between descriptivism and anti-descriptivism. I've said descriptivism is a hegemonic approach to reference. It postulates that reference is always mediated by a definite description. It is impossible to refer without the mediation of descriptive material, cognitively accessible to the speaker that determines the reference or domain of application on each occasion of use. Um, the externalist arguments used by Kripke, Pandem, and others show that it is possible to refer without the mediation of a cognitively accessible definite description. That, as Keith Donnellan put it, a backup of descriptions is neither necessary nor sufficient to refer. 
But the arguments are not supposed to show that terms cannot refer ever via associated descriptions. Results that show that some users are guided by the descriptive material people associate with a term are interesting as a report of how people use language, and as such, they invite philosophical reflection. But jumping, jumping to David and Porter's or to how Kyoja, Nyquist, and Gilka's conclusion is un unwarranted. The externalist, unlike the, the descriptivist, never assumed that all terms have to fit one mold. It was an issue about what makes ref is reference possible without the mediation of a description. And if the answer is yes, it means that there are terms that refer without the mediation of a description. It doesn't mean no term can refer with the mediation of a description. Um, it should be observed also that Panam didn't take back his twin earth case when he acknowledged that we might decide to call X, Y, Z water. This is a content because deep down, and this is a new issue, the important point was always metaphysical. Whether a substance whose molecular composition was largely X, Y, Z was the same substance as water or a different kind of thing. That's an issue. That's metaphysics. Now, as regards the Rice case, consider the following story. You're in a restaurant where the new seats, those that a substantial portion of people in David and Porter's experiment have no doubt in classifying as rice or a new type of rice. So those seeds are served in dishes that in the menu appear as containing rice. And you're having lunch with your very good friend who's severely allergic to most foods, but she can safely eat rice. Now the question is, will you order rice? For both of you, we do tell your friend, oh, look, here in the menu, it says that this has rice. It's sure that this is okay. See, Amy Thomason puts the point in terms of concepts, but I think that the claim travels easily to the categorization of kinds. This is a partly biographical story by Amy Thomason. She says, I have a child with a nut allergy. It is a matter of life and death. Death in seven minutes, her allergy tells us, whether something is biologically, it's, it's a matter of life and death, whether something is biologically a tree nut or is something called a nut. It is a matter of life and death because it enables us to predict whether in whether ingesting something will cause a life-threatening allergic reaction. This is not just a subjective matter whether a uh, tree nut is a better concept than one that includes all and only things called nut, including hazelnuts, peanuts, coconuts, nutmeg, and donuts, only the first of which is biologically a tree nut, and excluding cashews, pistachios, and almonds, who are nuts, that are nuts. That, that one concept, but not the other, is usefully and efficiently predictive in this way, which has life or death consequences is all I need to be fully convinced that one set of concepts is objectively better. Now, in general, the stories used in experimental philosophy tests, David and Porter's in particular, do not describe high stakes scenarios in which decisions have important consequences, consequences that involve us or someone very close to us. So they do not invite serious reflection. Participants in the experiments are not invited to think hard. They give unreflective responses, in part because the explicit aim of these studies is to collect immediate reactions. And the direct value of immediate and reflective reactions to philosophical theorizing is questionable. 
as I said, this is not to say that immediate reactions are never useful. As I said before, the reactions of my students about the bird pig case are very useful because they alert me of confusions. Some, but even sometimes for certain purposes, there may be a, these immediate reactions may be exactly what is, re, what is required. For instance, the psychological test on generics by Timpian, Brandon, and Gelman elicit immediate reactions that show that people judge that the proportion of, satis of satisfaction of a property attributed to members of a group by a generic statement is very high, while at the same time, they're ready to judge a generic true on the basis of much lower amount of satisfaction of that property by members of the group. Now, th that these data, which are data about immediate reactions, certainly invite a reflection on the acceptance of generics about human groups. There's a paper here about exactly these issues by Cella, Marchak, Bianchi, and Gelman, where they discuss all these issues. Um, now, all my considerations about rice, about the high stakes scenarios, and about um, about the importance of testing these things. Now, I don't know if these considerations speak in favor of further tests in which high stakes stories are presented. Um, I only know that if the results of potential new tests that take these issues into account contradict me, if it turns out that people would happily recommend their seriously allergic friend to have rice from that restaurant, um, I would not think that I should change what I think right now. In the circumstances envisaged, I would not risk hurting my friend. For the point is that without further scientific testing, we would not know if the new rice has some so far unobserved harmful effects. Two sorts of stuff having different underlying constitution may have displayed all the same observable behavior so far. But in general, we cannot expect that the same behavior will continue in all future contexts. And that's because they are different kinds of things, whether we call them with the same name or not, so it makes a lot of sense to be cautious. Um, and I think um, at least some of the participants in the Devitt and Porter studies were in fact quite conscious of that. Devitt and Porter report that they had to modify the vignette because several participants thought that we were asking them to judge the morality or legality of the chef's actions. Now, why would it be immoral or illegal for the chef to serve rice if it really was rice? Let me put a potential concern aside. It's not that people may have been concerned about the illegality of serving those seeds because they were stolen, stolen from a lab. Because there's another vignette in which the seeds are also stolen from the lab to do other things, and they didn't have to modify those vignettes. The only vignette that had to be modified because of concerns about something illegal or immoral was the vignette about the restaurant. Um, okay, so almost getting to the end. If we have two kinds, two kinds of things, it is usually wise to have two words. Of course, this is not always the case. We use jade for two different minerals. Nephrite and jadeite have a fundamentally ornamental value. So it may not be important to use different words for them in everyday life. But would we accept to use rice for the new seeds if there was the possibility that its different genetic structure provoked unexpected side effects, something that the David and Porter vignettes never bring up, would we 
if sufficient research definitely showed that the new seeds were as harmless as rice? It's difficult to tell, but the use of one word or two words should not mask the fundamental issue. And the fundamental issue is that rice and rice are different kinds of things. And the predisposition of people to use one word for two kinds, a predisposition that in my view has not been properly tested by David and Porter because of their reliance of, on unreflective responses to humdrum stories, not to high stakes stories, can do nothing to alter that more fundamental, more fundamental fact. Okay, thank you very much.